Hi, this is Ed from Wright. Today we're going to talk about carbureted versus EFI engines and some of the technology there. There's a number of different approaches to these engines in the market, and I feel like there isn't a very consolidated resource on specifically what is this technology that's under the hood. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. So first off, a carbureted engine has a device on the side of it that when the air goes through it, it pulls fuel in there at an appropriate mixture. It's a pretty simple, pretty straightforward mechanical device. And then those same types of engines, uh, they have uh, your coils that uh, fire the spark plugs, and when the magnet comes around the flywheel, it shoots a spark to that spark plug. It's fixed position, it's reliable, it's simple, it works well. Now, the thing about carbureted engines is that because they don't compensate completely for things like air pressure, air temperature, the engine's temperature, then it means that the engine's not gonna be running at the ideal or most efficient fuel mixture at all times. So the carburetor is always gonna run just a little bit rich in order to create a more consistent, reliable fuel burn. And that means it's gonna take a little bit more fuel. It'll help the engine run a little cold, cooler. Now on an EFI engine, the difference there is that an EFI engine has a little computer on the side of it and it's measuring things like the air temperature and airflow coming into it. And it's got a fuel pump and a, a fuel injector injectors that are accurately metering the correct amount of fuel into the combustion chamber based on the, the parameters that are, you know, and how the engine's running. And with that uh, fuel injection system, it can run more precisely uh, the fuel mixture more precise fuel mixture, uh, that means that it'll use less fuel. So in some cases, this could be um, 10, 20, or 25% less fuel, depending on the circumstance. And um, generally, the, when the engine's not working, typically these engines run, will run real lean and they'll uh, consume a lot less fuel at that high idle point, but the reality is that you're you're going to be running the engine at a higher load state. You're going to be bogging it down. Um, and in those ranges, you, you probably see somewhere in the mid to high teens um, fuel savings. Um, one thing to realize is that the fuel that a mower consumes has about an 80% correlation with the weight of the grass that's coming out of the discharge chute. So um, if you're cutting dry summer grass, you're going to have a significantly different fuel burn than if you're cutting heavy spring grass. Um, so that's the basics of, of what a fuel injection engine does. Now, under the hood, there's a couple technologies. So um, there's words like EGOV or ETB, electronic throttle body, or ETC, electronic throttle control, number of different words out there. So um, a carbureted engine has a very traditional device in it. Uh, it's a fairly precise um, device called a governor. And what a governor does, uh, and if you look at the front of an engine, oftentimes there's a small shaft coming out of the engine with an arm on it. And your throttle control, we call it a throttle control, it's actually not a throttle control, it's a governor control. Um, but that governor, that throttle control on the mower, when you pull it up, it pulls a spring on that arm. And the fly weights will slow the engine down and let the engine speed up, uh, connect to the throttle of the carburetor, uh, based on the fly weights in there. So it's creating this balance point to maintain that engine speed. And on a fuel injected engine, you can have a mechanical governor. And that's predominantly how most um, fuel injected engines have been produced over the past decade or so. Uh, and so you still have a throttle lever with a, with a cable that goes down to the governor and, and, man, and the governor manages the throttle on the engine. And then the fuel injection system has a throttle position sensor and reacts to that mechanical throttle position. Now, when we talk about EGOV or ETB or ETC, those technologies, um, what that basically means is that there's a servo motor that's gonna control the throttle there's no governor assembly in the engine, and it takes a reading on the flywheel. There's a sensor to measure the flywheel uh, speed and position to fire the spark plugs. And it uses that sensor um, to tell what the speed of the engine is. And if the engine's running too slow, then it will open the little servo to increase the throttle, uh, and the engine will speed up. If it goes too fast, it will pull that back a little bit. And in there, there's algorithms to appropriately balance things like overshoot or undershoot or throttle response and these types of things. Um, now, the benefit to electronic, electronic governors versus a mechanical governor generally is that they can maintain much higher blade tip speeds. Um, a governor, um, and, and, and by the way, if you've ever had an engine that hunts, you know, it goes, it cycles its speed. Um, that's what we call governor hunting. 
and a couple things that can cause that. Uh, it can just sort of be um, a harmonic between all the different subsystems that are, are doing it. Sometimes it could be because the throttles, the uh, carburetor is slightly clogged or something like that. So at a particular speed, the end, it starts, uh, the, throttle, the carburetor doesn't work correctly. So then it'll speed up to try to correct it and it'll create sort of a cycle um, oscillation in the governor. Um, it's not particularly harmful to the engine, uh, but generally isn't something that, you know, is expected. Um, and oftentimes when you do have a governor hunting, as soon as you turn on the blades, generally the hunting will go away because you've changed the characteristics of the system. There's now more inertia at a different load point and, and for the most case, governor hunting goes away. Now, one of the things to, that is done in order to make governors more stable is um, this, this droop in the RPM that happens. And when that happens, your blade tip speed comes down a little bit and you lose a little bit of power from the engine. So electronic throttle, um, engines with the sensor and the precision of the computer and the, and the accurate algorithms it uses to manage the over and undershoot, it can maintain almost perfect blade tip speed, um, which means you get a better cut, better discharge uh, in, in wet conditions, you know, might discharge uh, fan out a little bit better, uh, some things like that. So um, definitely in moderate to heavier conditions, uh, you'll find that uh, electronically governed engines perform a lot better. Now, um, they oftentimes have a little bit higher horsepower rating, but oftentimes the reality is if you take an engine and you go into field grass and you really bog it down, say that the engine is designed to run at 3600 RPM, which most of them are, um, 3600 has, is historically connected to the speed, it require, speed required to have a generator produce uh, 60 hertz power, um, and so it's this number that pretty much the whole industry operates off of. So typically 3600 RPM is the target speed. Uh, when you put it into heavy grass and maybe you bog the engine down to 2800 RPM, whether it's a mechanical governor or an electronic governor, the throttle is going to be wide open at that point. And you as an operator will be controlling the speed of the mower in order to keep the engine from stalling. And at that point, if the throttle is wide open, it doesn't matter if it was done mechanically or electronically. And the electric governor makes no difference at that point. So electric governors really shine at their best when you're not cutting field grass, it's when you're cutting heavy, regular grass in the springtime. That's when the, that's when the benefit really is there and it's a great benefit. Um, also some other things like, you know, you go up a hill or you turn on the blades or whatever, oftentimes the throttle response is faster. That's both because the electronic governor can get in front of that change a little bit more quickly. Um, and also oftentimes the fuel injection system, when it sees this rapid change in load, it'll actually uh, throw a little extra fuel in to get ahead of that, uh, that power that's needed. So it, they generally respond a lot quicker than your carbureted engines. So uh, definitely some advantages to your um, electronic, uh, electronically governed engines. Now, generally electronically governed engine is gonna be an uh, engine that it's you know, drive by wire of some sort. And so on the instrument panel, you may have an infinite lever that goes to an um, electronic sensor and that wire goes down to the engine. Um, typically, uh, there's a four and a half or five volt signal going to that um, throttle control. And when you move the lever, it varies some, from some lower point to five volts. And when you sweep the voltage, it, the engine responds uh, to the appropriate RPM. Uh, some machines will actually have a switch, a several position switch with different uh, resistance levels in it. And so those would be the different voltage levels that the engine would respond to uh, for those different speeds. Um, so if you'll know if a machine's either got electric um, governor or mechanical governor generally by seeing if there's a wire, a, a, an actual mechanical cable going to the engine or if it's an electrical connection going to the engine from that control. Um, some of the other technologies that are on a EFI engine is what we call closed loop or open loop. And so an open loop engine, um, it's the, the throttle body and sensors are pre-calibrated when it ships from the factory, they're all very precise components. And um, through the life of the machine, it's gonna dose the fuel according to those measures. A closed loop system generally has an oxygen sensor, which is a little device that's mounted to the muffler and it sniffs the exhaust coming out of the engine. Now, that sensor is um, only accurate when the fuel mixture is perfect or just a little bit lean and actually most engines sort of cycle their fuel mixture 
right across that threshold so they can get an accurate reading on that sensor. Um, and that can affect the um, long-term learn that happens inside the, the little computer chip on the side of the engine to maintain a more perfect calibration over the life of the machine. Now, one thing to realize about the oxygen sensor is most of the time when you're using the equipment, it's not being used. Um, the thing about that is that when your combustion temperatures get really hot, then we, the engine starts creating uh, NOx emissions. And so most cases, the fuel mixture is rich in just a little bit under higher load scenarios to keep the uh, exhaust temperatures down, but also for these air-cooled engines, it keeps the engine's air temperature down. And when that, that uh, mixture richening is happening, the oxygen sensor uh, can't read the fuel mixture at that point. So uh, when we talk about open loop or closed loop systems with the, with the oxygen sensor in them, um, oftentimes you'll find that you'll have an open loop system on something that's more of a performance type um, device, um, a motorcycle, a snowmobile, uh, maybe um, a, a motor on a boat or something like that. And then something that's made for like long term steady state loads um, something like a generator uh, is something that would be much more suitable for having that oxygen sensor uh, that can measure this sort of steady state and, and oftentimes not running at peak load. Um, so something like a motorcycle, right, there's uh, that you're constantly going through the gears, sweeping the RPM, there's almost not enough time, we might say, for the oxygen sensor to be effective or valuable and you're maximizing power and not necessarily fuel efficiency in that case. Um, now, as it pertains to outdoor power equipment and mowers, we tend to run our engines at really, really high load points. And so oftentimes uh, we're not using the oxygen sensor all that much. Um, my, it, my particular feeling on it is that um, the oxygen sensor is probably not that important to the outdoor power equipment industry. Um, I don't know that the fuel savings case is very um, uh, significant at all. Um, and I also have a huge priority on reliability. And so if you don't have an oxygen sensor, that's one less thing that, to, um, to not go wrong, right? Um, so there's two schools of thought. Um, it's not a significant thing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't let it be a decision factor on uh, what type of equipment you buy. But you'll notice that some fuel-injected engines have an oxygen sensor and some don't. And that's, that's what's going on there. Um, the other thing that fuel-injected engines have is they um, have a digital ignition and so um, it, they are able to advance or retard the spark timing and uh, that can be really good in different situations. It can um, manage your, uh, your combustion pressures, um, can help the engine operate uh, better in the full range whether it's low speed and starting or maximum efficiency at, at high speeds. Um, so the ignition timing is another thing you get with an EFI engine. Um, now, if we were talking about the pros and cons between carbureted and fuel ejected engines, obviously it's almost all about fuel savings. It can also be about throttle response and governor response, um, which are great to have. Um, now, a fuel injected engine, naturally, because there's you know, a little bit more complexity on board, and, and even then, there's, there's two general approaches. There's the component-based systems and the module-based systems. So the component-based systems, there's sensors around the engine, and wiring connections going to them in a, in a module based system. Generally the throttle body and the ECU um, is all in one module. Um, and so it generally there's less disconnections and things that can happen with it, but if you have to replace it, it may be slightly more expensive component. But this generally, my point is there's more components on board the engine. And so if any one of them are damaged or goes wrong, um, it might cost more than what you'd have on a carbureted engine, but generally it's pretty well proven that an EFI engine will save you a lot more money than you may incur in other maintenance or repair costs. Now, that's especially true the bigger the engine you get. So you'll find that um, in our case, in our big engines with you know, large displacements, we don't offer carbureted options. Uh, it's all EFI. Um, a lot of times up in that range, you're talking about the difference between 1.8, 2.0, two gallons an hour type fuel consumption, and that's really where the EFI payback, back, payback is um, very compelling. So generally on your big engines, you're gonna have all EFI. When you get into your mid, you'll have a mix, and when you get into your smaller engines, generally they're gonna almost always be carbureted um, across the range. Um, so yeah, there's, there's the, the two schools of thought there uh, in terms of um, 
fuel efficiency versus those repair potential repair costs. Now, generally EFI engines are very reliable. Um, they're pretty easy to scan. Uh, if they're thrown in code or anything like that, some have um, a wire you can actually make a connection to to get like a, a blink code from it uh, that you can look up. Uh, there's also a ability to connect a device to it so you can uh, read all the codes coming off the engine. So, um, and oftentimes the ability to read those codes makes the repair process um, a, lot, a lot easier. So those are some of the things that make the distinction between a carbureted engine and EFI engine. And then with an EFI, EFI engines, you have mechanical governors and electronic governors. You have the digital ignition. You have closed loop. You have open loop. Um, and again, I think this is informational. I think the biggest decision that you face when you're looking at buying an engine of a particular machine and the options that are on it, generally you're going to have a fuel injected or not. Um, and typically those other things, I was the details there are not um, necessarily decision points on that piece of equipment, but um, I hope this helps you understand a little bit of what's going on underneath the hood and why some of those features exist. Anyhow, hope you have a great rest of your year.